Mitch James. Yes. Welcome to Between Two Beers. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be here, Steve. We're in the Export Beer Garden studio tonight. Mitch, you must have knocked back a few exports in your time. Yeah, a couple uh, a couple goldies, a couple exports. Uh, they've been uh, known to be a drip down in Dunedin, where I've frequented many a time. So, uh, look, uh, nice and uh, easy on the gullet, nice and easy on the wallet. Oh, mate, clip that. Were you old <laughs> enough to remember the old party at Kelly Brown's house? Or Tony Brown's house, as it was? No, no, that was about a generation before oh, shit, me. I've just gone, but, uh, I've played my cards early and but, shown my age. But I, I, do, uh, I do love footy and uh, I do love a bit of Highlanders culture, so um, my old man's a diehard Highlanders supporter, so I've been aware that, uh, that Tony Brown likes to throw a party every now and then. He's a coaster <laughs> as well, your old man, isn't he? West Coast? Yes, he's from Greymouth. Yeah, oh. yeah, born and raised. Nice. Yeah. So we're recording this episode two days before the album launch. Yes. Uh, and I know it's been a long time coming. We're going to get into that. But how are you feeling right now, like right on, on the eve of, of the release? Yeah, feeling pretty good, to be honest. Um, it's, been, it's been such a whirlwind. I've been on the road uh, for the last couple of months, touring and flights every other day. And it's, uh, it's been a lot to take in, but it, it's, it's nice to be back home and, uh, yeah, feeling the love. So it, it's great. Yeah, feel good. Do you, get, do you get nervous before an album drops about the reception or is it at a point now where you're just like, ah, I'm, I'm going to put it out there regardless? I think there's a bit of both, Seamus, bro. Like, I, I, I like I actively train myself to not give a fuck, but like it's a trained skill, you know what I mean? Because I feel like if if you're too worried about things you can't control, it'll, it'll eat you up. But um, I used to be like a hectic numbers geezer and I would just every day look at the numbers, see how we're tracking. Oh man, but, you um, and Steve are going to get along just fine. Yeah. Right? It used to be like that, not yeah. like that anymore. You, though, it right? used to be like that. Cause, you uh, could learn a thing or two, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> you let go of the numbers. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's easier said than done. I'm sure you'll agree with me on that one, sure. Steve. Yeah. Um, but you've, I've, I've sort of heard you speak about the album. Then you mm-hmm. I haven't heard it yet, but you're saying it's, it's brutally vulnerable and brutally honest. Yes. Uh, so getting that out there, you know, uh, is that how do you feel about releasing that vulnerability? I've never really had much of an issue with it, to be honest, bro. Um, I, I've always I've always struggled with um, that Kiwi mentality of like blokes don't chat about shit and like it's you're a pussy if you reveal your feelings, and it's just never really uh, it's never really resonated with me. And so I've always felt like it's kind of my duty in a way to to be a bloke and you know like to be here sipping beers you know i love the footy i love the cricket i love you know i get up every every monday morning at 6 a.m to watch the cleveland browns like i'm still a lad oh, good man but um yeah it's <laughs> fuck, it's, it's a, a tough a, life i was gonna say that's a, <laughs> it's a that's fucking a, that, tough that's life a hard watch yeah it's it's brutal at the best of times but um i guess my point is is that like you know i'm just like every other lad except um I guess I just sing about my feelings. <laughs> yeah, and you've done a lot of growing up since the last album. I've, yeah. I've also heard you say 27 yes. now in yeah. the last four years. It's been a whirlwind, a lot mm. of highs and lows and everything in between. But do you feel very different as a man now than when you released your last album? Yeah, yeah, big time. I, I, I like to describe the first album as sort of like a boy turning into a young man and then this last one is uh, a young man turning into a man-man. And, and it's... um. Yeah, I, I mean, completely different human being, to be honest. You know, I was, you know, like I said, I was, I was reading the numbers and uh, therefore reading my own press a little bit. And yeah, I, I got, it got to a stage where I probably, uh, well, I definitely look back and I'm like, oh, fucking bit of a dick. Yeah. And um, man, we've all been there though. Like, yeah. I, cring- I cringe at some of the stuff that I've kind of done and said and and been. Yeah. Back in my day as well. Yeah, bro. Even I, now. I think it, it's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's 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 nice to be able to look at yourself and. And like grow from it, and and I think the cringe factor gets eased off a little bit when you, when you look at the growth, I guess. But um, yeah, very very different bloke that would be sitting here if you if you got me four years ago for sure. In the process itself, a hundred songs that you have written, and then you decide which what ten, twelve, however many to put on the album. Is that yeah. is that normal practice? I I guess it is. I mean, it is for me. I, I when I'm in writing mode um, and not touring, I, I tend to be rather prolific so i mean i would have had probably about 50 to 70 for the first album and then um yeah this last one i mean over four years it's it's only only what 25 a year so it's it's not that (laughs) 25 more than either steve and i've ever written or come close to have you you got got a couple in your up your music music background yeah um but with those (laughs) 50 or 70 like 
are some of them do some of them come out and you're like holy shit that is a banger that one's gonna go like do you know straight away i feel like you do with some of them but on, on the flip side for example 21 which ended up being my first sort of hit if you will it was um i remember leaving the session and being like oh that's a nice album i even said to the guy i wrote it with i was like that's a nice album track i don't think it'll be a single though um, so sometimes you never know you know it ends up ended up being one of the bigger moments in my career so yeah but there, there's a few on on this album where i remember writing it and being like surely you know <laughs> it's, 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 something's got to work there have but yeah it, it varies for sure have i picked up that everything's in lower case yeah um is it what's the rationale behind that are we allowed to know it was uh, to be brutally honest it's not even that cool it, it was just because that's how i would type uh. all the way growing up but um some people do all caps i actually write in all caps but um so when you're writing a song do you physically write with pen and paper or is that sometimes obsolete? sometimes really? yeah it's uh a, a lot more i find myself just on on the macbook uh, or on the notes on the phone um it's usually more notes on the phone now just because um I would find that in sessions I'd be like open up Firefox or Safari or whatever and just get go down rabbit holes and not focus on the shit that I'm <laughs> I'm meant to be doing. I'd be like looking at fucking cars or some <laughs> shit, I don't know, like Cleveland Brown stats. Yeah, Cleveland Brown stats usually uh heavy in the loss column. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're gonna get more into the process of songwriting a bit later, but I'm um, keen to start three days ago you were touring with Callum Scott. Yes. Take us inside <laughs> that world. What what is that like? Yeah, it's incredible. Callum is is my favorite person that I've ever met in music, and I've I've met a lot of them. And um, basically, two weeks before it started, um, I think they booted off the original support act for for whatever reason. It might have been a bit of a tosser. Um, and uh, Callum just got in touch and and said, "Hey, can you make this work?" And um, what does that look like in practical terms? Is he sliding into DMs? Is he <laughs> yes. are they working through studios? So I, I think that um, there was like some more formal uh, agency stuff done first, but then he he slid into my DMs and that is buzzy. and just said, "Hey, bro, you wanna you you wanna do this?" And I was like, "Fuck yeah, I wanna do this." And so, I mean, usually it takes months and months to to organize a tour. <laughs> We've been doing it very last minute, very on the fly, but we've made it work so far. I've only missed out on one gig due to not getting a visa. But the rest of it's been uh, full noise, train or plane every day. Go. We started off in Estonia, of all places. and Tallinn? Tallinn, Estonia? Yeah, Tallinn, Estonia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not just a pretty face, Seamus. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. It's done, it's done oh, that's work. the nicest thing anyone's ever seen you on the podcast. <laughs> so what, what sort of crowds are we talking about here? Uh, they tend to be like between like 1,500 and 2,500 and, and they're just these beautiful theatres that, um, yeah, Callum's got this, got a really amazing fan base and, and they're all, they all just have a little touch of bouge to them. So like we're in these beautiful theatres and man, some of the, some of the venues have just been mind blowing like uh, London and Paris and Brussels, they're all just these beautiful old theatres and yeah, it's, it's been incredible, an incredible experience and just to get out there and and spread the good word amongst the, the people of places I'd never get to go to or, or even dream of going to has been, been pretty special. There may, there may be a few sort of ignorant music questions coming here, but oh, we're, we're just going to fire away. But what does it look like when you're that's in Calum? That's where I wanted to go. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, same, yeah. some of the minds. Like, are you are you there doing a tight hour, just sort of setting the scene for him to come in and do a two-hour set? Or how, what's, what's the deal? So I'm on for half an hour as it stands, and um, it was me and my guitar player that's a – whole nother story but uh had to part ways with him midway through the tour and so basically i just uh yeah try and try and get everyone g'd up for it it's uh it's a bit um it can be a bit touch and go with the theaters because they're all seated you have to really win them over but i, I would say out of i think we've done about 26 shows and I'd, I'd say there's only be two of them where i left stage and was like oh bit of a shit crowd oh really a little but, bit ropey yeah but i mean the other 24 or whatever it is like you you get that feeling of like I've, i feel like i've set the the mood nicely and then callum just slams at home with 90 minutes of uh international smash bangers basically what do you what do you specifically do after you've done your set do you just slide backstage and watch the main show do you cruise back to the hotel like what I've watched a lot. Of, I've watched Callum a lot this tour, <laughs> <laughs> a lot. Um, but yeah, no, I'll slide back to the green room, shower up, uh, get stuck into a couple of beers, and um, depending if I have like a flight the next morning, like there's been some lobby calls at like two a.m. and I finish at like ten, so can't be doing it that night unless you really want to fuck tomorrow up. Um, 
but yeah, it's uh, it's either get a little bit uh, get a little bit tipsy watching Callum and have a good good time in the crowd, or uh, flight at two a.m. the next day. <laughs> and, and and flight like logistics, transport. Are you guys like side by side on the plane? Has he got his own plane? Like, has he got his own? Like, what is again? I'm, I'm fanboying out yeah, here because yeah, I, no, I want to pull sure. back the curtain on, on um, what international touring looks like. So, when you're a support act, especially one that's uh, been drawn up basically two weeks before, like they have all of their travel arrangements and all of their crew and and band and stuff, and and basically I'm just I'm just fucking making it happen by myself. Um, so yeah, like I was I was on one of their flights, um, and again, keep in mind there's been about literally 30 of them yeah right. i was on one of their flights just by chance um and all throughout europe i had to pay for my own hotels and everything but uh in asia they they hooked it up with the five-star hotel treatment and i uh nice. i was loving that room service uh, definitely got charged to callum um nice but uh yeah other than that it's basically you're on your own but but callum when you're like at the show and and you're in that environment i couldn't have ask for a more like inclusive and an amazing like group of people so it's it's just yeah I, I think just as a support act on a world tour generally it's like every man for themselves but i've been lucky that they've included me more than like a, your typical tour would and and are you like is there a little have you got scope for a little entourage with you as well or are you literally i've literally been by myself the last uh <sighs> the last month but it was it was me and my guitar player up until then just us and then, um, yeah, it's been just me for the last month. It's it's pretty full on, bro. Like, the the amount of organization that goes into it. Like, Callum's got like a tour manager, a production manager, a stage manager, and, and a stage tech, all just to organize shit. And that's got nothing to do with the promoters who have got their own team of organizers and everything. And I'm just like standing here in the corner, like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> At least a few terms on your rider. Yeah, but a slide a couple of green M and M's in there and. Couple, uh, couple beers and a pepperoni pizza. Like to keep it simple, nice. but um, yeah, I, I realized after having thirty pe- pepperoni pizzas in a <laughs> row that it gets pretty fucking old. <laughs> what's uh, what's the the level of fame like with a guy like Callum? Mm. Like, like after the show, obviously everyone's there for him. Everyone knows who mm. he is, and you're there with him. Mm. Is the on is are people desperate to hang out with him and, and yeah. party with him afterwards? <laughs> are there lines of yeah? yeah yeah all of the above yeah so as soon as you get out um of the venue uh some fans are uh crazy man they they find the back entrance and there's lines and they're just literally waiting for him and he's awesome with them you know he takes photos and does this and that and makes sure everyone feels special um but yeah man it's there's all of the above it's pretty crazy and i i remember in london i was i thought that we were like at a secret secret back door and i was I was quite chopped at this stage and I was walking out sipping beers and literally it was like that old sort of thing you see in, in movies where like you open the door and it's just camera flashes and blah, oh, blah, wow. blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I was, I remember literally being like, holy fuck, oh, and that was my genuine reaction. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's it's just like that in, in every city and uh, Asia, they, he's got his own security guard and they have to like shut it off because it's even crazier there than Europe. So it's it's pretty nuts. Like he's a, he's a very very famous guy. But you've you've got there's got to be pockets of Kiwis that are there just for you, right? There's got to be the Kiwi flag and the yeah and the All Black shirt in there and 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 people that are stoked to see you around the world. Yeah, there's a few. I mean, definitely in London, I could I could feel that energy. It was probably my favorite show of the bunch, which is probably no coincidence. But yeah, there's a few Kiwis in there, and I feel hear a few people singing the songs. But um. Basically, it's it's been like a, I view it at least as like a, a mission to go out and and win over all these people. So it's been it's definitely been succeeding. But um, shout out to the to the couple uh, OGs that got in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Does that um being in front of people and performing? You've done hundreds of shows now. Does that sort of spark dim at all, or is every time are you just fully charged and energized and up for it? Yeah, I, I'm always always up for it. It's I feel like the the moment that that feeling goes away is probably the moment I need to reflect on whether this is what I want to do because it's it's such a rush. I mean, there's no there's no feeling like it. There's no adrenaline. Well, I mean, technically it is just adrenaline, but like there's no like drug or or no booze or anything that could make you feel 
that good and it's it's my favorite feeling in the world so if it if it stops i probably need to re uh re look at the drawing board <laughs> examine your choices yeah um okay i'm keen to sort of tell the story paint the picture of mitch james we've given a little bit of a, a snapshot there of, of what the last weeks months have looked mm. like but you've got such an incredibly deep path to where you got to and uh, i think we need to start at the beginning and i, and I read an essay that you wrote in the Herald in 2018, just before mm. the release of your first album, which dealt with issues of suicide and mental mm -hmm. health. And it was such a, a powerful, important read. Thank you, bro. And as much or as little detail as you want to do, are you able to help start the journey of, of perhaps we can start with those difficult high school years, the teenage years that helped mm. sort of form the person that you've turned into? Yeah, for sure. I mean, so life was pretty pretty normal for me up until about 14 15 and um and yeah and things just uh one or two things happened at school and that resulted in me not being the most uh the most popular dude in the year or whatever and um and basically uh you know I, I was really struggling with my mental health and I had no friends and no one to talk to and music was sort of my only refuge at the time and um yeah I mean I was on different sorts of SSRIs they wouldn't work got put on more hectic ones and um and I remember being 16 and and being in hospital because I was trying to go cold turkey off these depression meds that this doctor had given me and I was having these brain zaps which weren't medically like uh, explainable at the time and I was in all of this agony and ev everything was shit at school and when you're in school like school is life you know what I mean all the social circles and and everything is uh it's everything so I was having an awful time and um, and basically uh, I wasn't getting along with my, my parents and my family at the time because the only way that thing that would make me happy was smoking weed and so they were very traditional and, and conservative in their mind frame towards it at the time and uh, so home was shit, school was shit and I was just very depressed and um, yeah I mean there, there was two instances where I, I tried to kill myself and you know it's it's crazy to talk about now but i feel like i said it's my duty to to be honest about things but yeah um my my sister one time um i boarded up my door and she's bloody four foot eleven weighs 30 kg somehow sunny build her way into the room and and um and basically talked me down and stopped me and yeah it was a very crazy time and and a very dark time and yeah it's it's been a while now that would be about 11 12 years ago um but yeah it's uh it's like i said i feel like it's my duty to talk about it and yeah there was a few times where it got so dark that i, I couldn't see a way out yeah it can be really confronting hearing someone say something like that it's powerful it grabs your attention but it is important mm. to talk about and and yes. again that essay that you wrote was powerful too because there are people there are kids teenagers going through exactly what you went through and not needing to know that they can find the light Mm. what what do you say, what's your advice what do you say yeah well I, I think for for kids now it's e even harder you've got the pressures of Instagram and TikTok and you've got to be this perfect human otherwise you you're not valued in society and and I think it's reinforced within social circles at schools and young people as well it's just the the culture it's very worrying and I worry for these younger kids because man like I was struggling big time and I didn't have to worry about being I don't know what they do on TikTok or whatever but you know it's it's it seems to be more intense from my my perception and I think I think I would say that firstly like school is not life and you need to I guess grit your teeth and 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 find a way through and have other passions and other circles that can can bring some light into your life but even for the people who don't have that it's it's yeah, it's very hard and I, I just, I don't really know what to say, you know, apart from just it's it's all got to be perseverance and surrounding yourself with, with positive people with with good energy and, and yeah, I mean, again, in saying that, I, I, I look back and I feel like I didn't even have those things at that time, so what do you say to someone that, that doesn't? I, I, I don't really know, but it's, I mean, if, I, if you can listen to me and know that I've been there and I'm loving my life now, however long later, and it's such a distant memory, then I can be the example, I guess. 
was 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 music that escape for you? Because I've read that you were YouTube taught, not self taught, but YouTube yes. taught. Was like yeah. like with the weed, was the weed and the music were those kind of the two things that that held you together? Yeah, and they they seem to merge quite well yes. as well. Well, <laughs> well I, see, I see that like I see that you, you reference Ben Harper and stuff like that. Who mm. you know in terms of like musical influences, like Burn One, one Down, Down is one yeah. of my one of my favorite yeah. songs. Um, yeah, so I'm just kind of interested in 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 that kind of combination. Yeah, it, it, bro, it was everything to me. Like, um, I did have like one or two mates, and um, after school, you know, they weren't in my year, and I didn't get to spend any time with them at school. But we would we would go out after school, and we'd drive somewhere, and we you know we'd have a little smoke and and listen to some music, and that's when I felt free. You know, it's cliche as fuck, but it, it's it's true. And and so after we'd get dropped back home and I'd, I'd kind of get disowned at the dinner table for being real blazed and smelling <laughs> smelling like nuggets <laughs> but um after that as soon as those duties were done it was pick up the guitar and try and get better at that because it was just I, I would lose myself in it and I feel like the escape is when you're in that hole you're just searching for escape whatever it is and you know I think uh for me being able to focus and 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 get lost in the music was definitely the the genesis of of everything that I have today is yeah because I just got so lost in it that I didn't have time to think about school or I didn't have time to think about my my parents and and stuff like that so yeah it was the ultimate escape I would argue I don't want to run your school down um mm. I do, uh, uh, but, I'm, I'm, <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious in terms of like teachers or, or or people that were around you at the time. Could they sense or pick up, or did they try and kind of guide you in any stretch or any way? Nah, I mean, I <laughs> I love being a little shit at school. I I there's a, a few teachers that would probably look at me now and be like, "Whoa, never saw that one coming." Does, does anyone get in, try and get in contact with you or kind of mend or build those bridges, it's students or teachers? Not really. I mean, the head of my boarding uh, house, uh, he he got in touch and he he's a good man and uh, he got me to speak to to the boarding house not too long ago, which was which was really cool because I feel like that was a a different sort of vibe to all all, all the day kids and um you know someone uh someone that was at the boarding school when i was there uh, sadly took their lives as well around that time so it was yeah i felt like it was important for me to to get in and do that but my uh i feel like the loyalties to a boarding house are, are very different to to a school and i that might sound like uh a bit weird to to people who weren't at boarding school but uh, i'm sure the people who were boarders would understand what i mean by that yeah you you attempt to take your life you're at rock bottom. You've got nothing left in your world to live for. And then you kind of, I guess you pull yourself out of it and then you do it again. Mm. After that, the rebuilding phase, is it kind of a, a slow linear like climb out of it? W were there other dips when you hit rock bottom again or, or like with the music and the weed, like how did you, how did you piece your life back together? Yeah, I, I think it's uh in some ways it's a, it's a slow linear climb and in other ways it's it's always just like anything in life the uh the up and down nature of it but i think looking back it was it was definitely um it was definitely probably more of the slow linear climb just because i had my dream and i knew that nothing was going to get in the way of it and that was the that was the thing that got me through all of the um all of the ups and downs in the meantime you know uh like when i went over to london i had no money and n no relationships no idea what to do in the music industry but i knew that this was however i was going to get there i was going to get there so it was the it was the motivation of that dream that just kept me put put uh, essentially putting one foot in front of the other and in, in pursuit of that goal and the goal itself slowly lifted me out of of that hole because I, I realized I could do it. You know, when I'm playing in front of people and they're responding in the way that I want them to, I know that I I, I had something that was worth getting that uh, that motivation. Well, yeah, you obviously have a, a reputation. People in your community would know that you're troubled and the stuff is going on. Mm. Did you also have a reputation as an incredibly talented musician, songwriter? Did people know that side of you? Yeah, I, I, I think a, a, a few people did, but a very, very small amount of people. Like music, until I 
until I really pursued it was the most personal thing you could ever imagine. Like I didn't, if it meant, cause, cause of how down I was and everything, if I got some form of rejection in my safe space, like, oh, that would have yeah. been, that would have been yeah. gnarly. So it was, I, I felt like I was good, but I didn't want to just uh, expose that vulnerability to people at the time. And I remember, yeah, having a couple <laughs> beers on a Saturday and then, you know, maybe the guitar would come out. It might be the treat of the night for my mates or whatever. And um, Is yeah. there a sort of a whisper going around yeah, the party? Gonna, like, yeah. Holy gonna, fucking shit, I was going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> he's got the guitar, he's got the guitar. Yeah, 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 pretty go, much. Pretty much. Roll pretty another much. one up, roll another one up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's on. Yeah. But yeah, it was, uh, that was like my first exposure to playing in front of people was like, yeah, just a, a couple couple boys and a couple lasses on a, on a Saturday night, you know, I might sneak off into another room because I didn't want to play in front of everyone and just play for like four or five people maybe. And yeah, that's, that's kind of where it all started, I guess. Yeah. So when did that turn into a dream of wanting to make it something bigger? Mm -hmm. Was there a particular moment or was it a slow burn as well? A lot of, uh, a lot of weed references. In tonight's <laughs> episode. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I, I would say the, the one pivotal moment uh, for me was, was going to Ed Sheeran. I remember, um, I can't remember what year it was, but I would have. I was a big baseball player growing up, and I represented New Zealand and at all the age groups, and it was my dream for the longest time. And uh, I remember sort of getting to a stage where uh, I I didn't think that it was going to happen in, in baseball for for a number of reasons, and so I was kind of at a bit of a crossroads. And no, Ed Sheeran at this time wasn't Ed Sheeran; like he was. He was sort of like a little secret that I had held from everyone else. I was like, fuck, this dude's music yeah. sick. I really resonate with it. So I went and saw his concert and I, I left just like, man, if, if this fucking dude, this ginger dude from Suffolk can, can do it and have everyone captivated with nothing else but apart from this pedal, like, fuck, I reckon I can, I can do that as well. So I, I, left, I left feeling like, uh, like challenged. Uh, and I knew that that was from that moment. That's what I wanted to to do. And so I basically, you know, followed his blueprint down to a T with the whole London thing and everything, which didn't turn out the way <laughs> I'd expected it to. But yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I want to jump in here. So, mm. and again, I'm going to read a, a little passage from that that uh, piece you wrote in 2018. Mm. So you gather enough mm. money to buy a one way ticket to the UK. Mm -hmm. In the article, you say while I was in the UK and Europe. I slept on the streets for a total of seven weeks, played more than 230 gigs, busked more than 100 times, was robbed, beaten up, and witnessed a brutal stabbing. I'm keen yeah. to dig around in this area for a little yeah. bit, if you're right. Like, so, yeah. so you, you arrive in Sheeran blueprint, by the way. If yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that the Sheeran blueprint? <laughs> in theory, it was, but mine just got a bit more extreme than than old Teddy's. But yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was a it was a very interesting time because, like I said, like the dream was. It was like the the fuel that would never run out. Like I was I was always going to do it, but I don't know. Sometimes in my life, I just take the like the more challenging route. Um, and so, you know, I wasn't really talking to my parents uh, at the time, and so I had a chip on my shoulder and was like, I'm gonna fucking do this, and I, I might have to do it the hard way or or whatever. But you know, I'd probably watch too many X Factor auditions. I thought that everything was just gonna fucking fall in my lap. But yeah, I, I went over and I I basically just had this dream and I didn't know anything about the industry and you couldn't find the shit on Google about the industry that you could today. This is 2012, this is 10 years ago. And everything that I knew about the industry was like shitty blog pages and that's about it. So basically the what I thought was the go was like just get out there and expose yourself to as much, not in that way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> get, get out there and, and expose yourself to as many people as you That's can. That's the Ed Sheeran blueprint. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, yeah, and so it was open mic nights and, um, you know, at open mic nights in London, at least back then, it was, it was pretty decent. Like, there's a lot of music industry people there. I got a lot of cards and, you know, they'd be like, do this little jingle and get a couple hundred pounds or whatever. And so... I played a, a bajillion open mic nights and then when I could or when I could I would busk, which was like yeah, it was it was most days for about half a year. Um and yeah, I just got stuck in and got after it and 
you know the things that you see when you actually when you have no money um and you're essentially on the streets in europe are, are pretty fucked up like in um in amsterdam at uh vondel park which is this this big fucking park i guess um there's like a big homeless community there and there's like these little bridges that you bike under because everyone bikes in amsterdam but they they sleep there and um i was basically uh pulling up for the night uh, um i had like my uh guitar case uh as a a pillow essentially and um in my suitcase or whatever and basically i heard this uh bit of a commotion near one of these uh little bridge things and um people yelling in dutch and um then basically just see a bit of a physical altercation and then this one dude just falls on the ground and these dudes just start running away and um yeah it was pretty uh it was pretty intense like as a 18 year old who's you know i've gone to private school life mm. e even though life hadn't been great it had been pretty sheltered um so then to to be seeing this shit and being like man like there's no fallback here like this is my reality right now it was pretty pretty confronting at the time and so yeah it was it was a lot of just uh street life i guess and it's not like all all hoodlum shit but it's it's mostly just yeah it's mostly just kind of people struggling basically and you just see a lot of fucked up stuff did, <laughs> did, did any part of you at any point of of that those difficult times that seeing that fucked up stuff did any part of you want to just get on a plane and come home to the safety and security of of new zealand i think i'd be lying if i said like a hundred percent no but it would only be like a one to two percent no like i, I again like I've, the dream was so strong that i i just you know I, I was thinking about this the other day like you know when you have like life things like you've got like your family or your friends or a relationship or a job or whatever like it's it's a lot harder to chase a dream full on because you've got these things that you have to tend to and at the time i i didn't have any of those things so it was a lot easier for me to be like well what the fuck else am i gonna do you know so i really just honed in and yeah i mean i, I still consider myself extremely lucky because there's so many people that want this dream and it doesn't happen but I mean, I didn't have any of those things or mental blocks holding me back. Um, so I found it, yeah, not really a challenge to, to keep going. I'm going to go against this. Yeah, Sorry, go on, go I'm, I'm, I'm curious to kind of chart the progress from being uh, protective of your gift and performing in front of a, a handful of selected people to going to a new country. Was it the anonymity of nobody knowing who you were that gave you the courage to kind of go to those open mic nights and busk? I don't know if it was the anonymity more so than it was just I'd flipped a, a switch in my brain to be like, well, if you want to do this for a living, it's not going to come on a Saturday night in front of like five mates. Right. It's yeah. and yeah, so I, I've I mean, to be honest, like I, I still struggle with the concept of like playing in front of thousands of people like it's it's not natural and it's fucking weird. <laughs> but I can just I, I'm lucky that I can just flick the switch and just go into like fucking rock star mode you know what I mean and just embrace it rather than than falter to it because if you have one minuscule fucking gram of doubt in there you're fucked people will see that through see right through you on stage you know it's all about your energy I always believe that and and always say that so if your energy's not locked in you're not gonna you're not gonna be up on that stage next time Gra grafting away as a busker is a scene that i've got a lot of questions about <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah man, um, totally like do you have a greatest like are there certain songs that you know are gonna pull in the money are there like days so where you have oh sally can wait yeah <laughs> you know like, all the oasis tracks um yeah bro there, there's wagon wheel <laughs> yeah bro honestly like the, from the trial and error of it like you're, you're doing, you're trying so much shit and 95% of it fails, but you notice when, you notice when the people start to build around. I never really had, up until I like was at the very end of my busking days, I, I never had any speakers or anything or any mic. So it was all just me and my guitar. So to bring, to get people in was quite like a, a thing. 
And so like, you're always like taking notes of what did I do to bring these people in because they come and they go and they come and they go. And, but when you're living off canned sausages, like you need as much money as possible. So when they're putting in like a fiver or whatever, you're like, oh shit, what was that? Was that under the bridge? Fucking hell. I was going to say under the bridge. Yeah, what were the, don't look back in anger. What were the other um, biggest tunes that you I mean, could regularly pull out that would draw a crowd? 21. <laughs> Sunday morning. <laughs> I, I, maybe now. Um, but I, I remember, um, yeah, under the bridge uh, was big. Thinking out loud, um, massive. <laughs> um what else i i always i mean i'm a massive oasis fan like one of the biggest you'll find but i always i always really haven't liked wonderwall that much so i had a bit as of as you're right man as is your right <laughs> yeah and so i i never really i every any anytime anyone's like play wonderwall i'll be like nah fuck off like but um yeah I'm not, don't, se- I'm not selling out <laughs> don't, don't look yeah exactly don't look back in anger live forever um champagne supernova did that make a little a little yeah, not not really. No, it not doesn't, really. Doesn't hit. Um, doesn't hit. Yeah, and sometimes <laughs> when they don't, and sometimes they don't. Yeah. Um, what else? It's been a while, man. Um, could could you busk now? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I mean, I obviously, <laughs> I know you could, but <laughs> no, like, he's lost all those skills. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <nah. laughs> I can't Stupid. do busking anymore. Like we should start it like undercover busker or something yeah. like that. Yeah, 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 yeah mate. Like you know where to, you know where I am. Have yeah. Me up. Um, um, yeah. I, I mean, it's just all the classics. What is that? Um, when the rain is blowing in your, I'll make you feel my love. That was a good Isn't one. It amazing how someone can just do that. Like you and I were trying to sing on the drive up, and it was shit house compared to. <laughs> I thought we sounded pretty good. Uh, but yeah, it's all the classics. What was what was an, an irregular income from a day of busking? Like what was the lows and the highs? What was the b- best day you've ever had? Uh, so uh, the best day I ever had uh, would have been Munich. Um, but Munich's very German in the way they do it. So like you have to audition. You can only play one slot. Um, once a week they have uh or maybe it's one slot twice a week and they have uh a.m and p.m slots for every single day so again there was like a lot of trial and error but i think uh, maybe like around just over 300 euros for that that my best day ever um but you know i would try and do it when bayern munich are playing champions league games and just cheat the system a little bit like that but i mean typically speaking like on a on like an average day, the median probably like thirty. That's mm. that's that's not great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's enough. It's enough. Usually, I found it was enough to get a hostel, some fucking like canned sausages, um, which are just so gross, <laughs> um, and and yeah, like a Tesco meal deal mm. essentially. And so like it's it's not living lavish, but um. Do it's look, definitely where I cut my teeth. Do you look back fondly on those times in terms of like honing honing your craft and your performance skills? I, th- I think I look back at it with an an admiration for the drive behind it because you know when things come in and levels of comfort come in, and like you, we were saying about friends, family, relationships, blah blah blah. You know now that I I have a sense of most of those things, like I look back and I'm like, well, if I was in that situation now, like I don't know if I could have done it because I have all these, these, uh, it's kind of shit to call like family and friends and shit like a block, but like that was how I would have viewed it back in the day, you know? So I, I do look back with like a, holy shit, that, that dude's crazy. And yeah, I mean, uh, there's some traumatic shit that happened and it was very full on, but yeah, I, I think I just admire that dude <laughs> more than anything. Is the, is the dream of the open mic nights that there's going to be someone one night in the crowd who's going to see you and think, shit, well, I need to sign this guy. A Star is Born. Is that yeah, the premise that, of that song? Uh, the sh- movie, right? I think yeah. so. You tell, you tell uh, me, bro. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen it either. <laughs> I haven't seen it because apparently every musician's like, don't watch it, it'll yeah, just make actually, you fucking miserable. Yeah, don't. Yeah. Don't, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. What, what were we saying, sorry? The... The open the, mic the nights. Open Are you hoping yeah, there's someone yeah. in the crowd who's going to recognize your talent and that is going to be the, the start of your path yeah. to success? Yeah, I mean, that was, I mean, it's such a different world now, but that was probably the last age of where that was a possibility, albeit a remote one, but still, I mean, like I said, I played hundreds of the things and, and basically, like, a normal night at an open mic night in London is get a free feed. Yeah. like from the pub get a couple beers maybe if you're lucky um but the better ones like uh i remember once um played an open mic night and 
uh, there's this girl uh, who worked at a studio uh, for this guy who had um, wrote in uh, Peter Andre Mysterious Girl wow. from way back in this the day. Tune. Mm. Yeah, and so um, I ended up working with with him and his son for a, a, a little bit, and uh, nothing really happened there. And um, you know, like I said, there was the jingles things, and there, there was quite a lot of. Is it uh, like ads? Like yeah, like I remember they had like a um, a personal ad. Um, See if I can remember the lyrics. You know, uh, I just can't wait to be king from yeah. Lion King. As fucking that was, I just can't wait to be clean. So I was <laughs> okay. like, nice. uh, oh, fuck, it's embarrassing. So I'm going to be a mighty king, but mum, please don't complain. It's like some shit about laundry. It's like, oh, I just can't wait to be clean. <laughs> and so I got so like 100, 100, 100 pounds for that, which was like, in those days, I was like, fuck yeah, let's go. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, just a lot of like... Uh, I guess it's like just little bits and bobs that you get. Like I never had any chats to anyone from any labels. It was all just like independent studios or like you could come to this writing session or, or do shit like that. It never was what I expected it to be, which was that, you know, like I said, probably watch too much X Factor and sing one song and then everyone's <laughs> like, bang, that's the golden buzzer, which is what happened to Callum, uh, uh, funnily enough. And he's, he's made a, an amazing career and life out of it, but... No, it didn't happen to the kid from New Zealand. Yeah, I'm, I'm keen to chart now, and Shay's got it in the notes, as the blow-up. The glow-up, should it be? The blow-up? But Either or. <laughs> was it, and and correct me if I'm wrong, if there's some steps in the way to, to pl please tell them, but was it a YouTube video of a mashup that you did that caught the attention of Sony and you got a, a record contract off that? Or was there any steps before that? Yeah, I, I, so... I hadn't really been putting up any videos because, again, it was that sort of personal thing that I was just kind of scared of the ultimate rejection that if it was tangible for me to see the results and it wasn't going to work, then it would just ruin my <laughs> life. Um, but basically, I, I, had this, um, I had this big bender in, um, in a Spanish uh, place called Mallorca with, with a friend of mine, and the plan was to, to busk over there and, and do all of that there. And... I realized pretty quickly that they don't like English speaking music because I made like zero dollars and zero cents. And so we had a bit of a, um, an existential bender and uh, we, we had this big night and we've never come so close to death. It was just like crazy how hard we went. And then the next day I woke up and I, I said to my mate, I was like, fuck it, bro. Like, what have I got to lose? Like, I got nothing to lose. Fuck it. Let's film a video. Let's just put it up. Let's see how it reacts. And the first one did really, really well. Second one did even better, et cetera, et cetera. And I think on like the fourth or fifth one, um, I got a, I was in Germany busking in Munich and um, I got an email from Sony and the, the footer on the email was like super low resolution. Um, so I was like, oh, fuck, this is bullshit. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's, you know, at least like get a proper f fucking yeah. footer. Um, if you're going to try to scam me. But I, the more that I looked into it, the, the more it looked legit. And yeah, so I um, I basically uh, found my way home, which is a whole nother story. Um, great story, but... We've got time. Yeah, we've yeah. got time. Um, so I, I found my way home uh, via Amsterdam. It's a, it, it is a great story. Tell we'll, it. We'll, I'll get to that okay. story okay. once okay. I finish this one. Um, and so, yeah, I, uh, I came back and... Um, I did this uh, piece on, I think it was Breakfast or Seven Sharp or one of the likes, and Sony had already been in touch, and then all the other labels started, they saw that and they started to be interested, but um, I'm a loyal man, so I, I went with um, with Sony in the end, and yeah, basically after that, I had uh, maybe four or five months until my first song came out, and then that's when it all, that's when it all started, yeah. Well, Amsterdam tell, story? Tell okay, us, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you, can't, you can't tease a, a yeah. story and then <laughs> yeah, <fair laughs> not enough. deliver on it. Um, so basically, uh, I didn't know that at the time uh, Amsterdam had just changed their busking laws to you can only busk in the red light district for 20 minutes a day. Um, so again, me having no money, I was like, fuck. So I, I got there, I tried busking, got told off by the police a couple of times. Um, and I was basically like, well, if you're going to do this, like, I have no money. Like, you got to, like, send me home. Absolute chancer. Like, <laughs> never going to happen. <laughs> um, and so I, uh, I was walking through, uh, 
through, walking through Amsterdam and uh, I sat down at this cafe, uh, started scabbing their Wi-Fi and um, I was chatting, pardon me, I was chatting to a mate uh, on Skype because Skype was a thing back was then. Thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so basically, uh, basically I was telling him how about, I was like, oh, I'm fucked here, bro. Like, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do. Like, all of my mates have no money at this time and we're all fucked. Um, and so uh, one of the dudes who worked at the cafe overheard my uh, my uh, my mayor and basically was like, bro, like, we can give you a, we live upstairs. We can give you a place to stay for the night. Um, I was like, sweet. Sounds good. Um, he made me a toasted cheese sandwich, which at that stage may as well have him given me like a hundred grand. It was just like so welcome. And then uh, I ended up staying the night with them, and um, and the boss of the uh, the cafe downstairs uh, basically gave me some work for a week and got me to play a gig on on King's Day, which is the biggest piss up in in the Netherlands, and. So that got me enough um, money to get home, um, but I'm still really good friends with uh, those boys to this day, which is cool. I just saw them in Amsterdam when uh, we we're, were on tour there, so it was it was a pretty special, like full circle moment for them to see to see that. But yeah, it was um, yeah, I managed to make my way home uh, through that, and uh, I've never played a, a gig so fucked up in my life. <laughs> it was King's Day is for real. Just um, just that full circle moment. It kind of occurred to me as you were talking that you've probably busked in. A lot of the cities that you've just finished touring yeah does that blow your mind to th to think about the glow up from from busking days <laughs> yeah, yeah. To, to playing in those to playing in those like uh arenas and venues yeah it was it was real special bro it was something that i felt was probably more a personal thing um Absolutely. uh but yeah to be in in munich especially was a big one for me because um L london and munich were were basically where i spent most of my time busking but it was real special to, you know, I could have never dreamed of being on some of these stages. Like London Palladium is is one of the most beautiful venues in the world. It's, you know, every single artist that I respect is, has played there. And, you know, Adele just did a big, uh, some fancy ass concert there. And it, it was, it, yeah, it was super crazy to be like, man, I was just outside where the gig was busking like nine, 10 years ago, like literally around that area. And so, yeah, it was it was a very very big pinch pinch myself moment. Yeah, for the sure. um, the pepperoni pizza and the beers must have gone down pretty good oh, at some yeah, of those. Some of those, some of, good that some of those moments. <laughs> yeah. um, process is question of the music. I was talking with Shay on the drive up about this. I, I'm interested in how it works. So you get signed by Sony, right? Obviously, they want you to put out an album. It yeah. doesn't come out till 2018. Mm. Do you create a whole bunch of songs and then? Is there a, a strategic way of drip feeding some of them as singles to build the hype before you release the album? Yeah, I, I mean, good I question, man. That's uh, Thanks, that's bro. usually a bit out of my pay grade, to be honest. That's uh, that's where you trust the the label uh, to do it, as it's their sort of profession and they understand it better than than I did. But how it worked back then was, um, yeah, like I had a bunch of songs that I'd already written, but uh, they were very, uh, how do I say, like they weren't radio ready because i i feel like the things that i was talking about were quite they were very like young man who's been sleeping on the streets kind of shit <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah i had to like refine a bit and um jaden who was my a and r he uh he put me in some some writing sessions with some people that were more like industrialized and knew what the fuck they were doing and that sort of being in that environment i was like Oh, I, I think I like totally get this. And so the, the first few, actually the first ever co-writing session I did ended up being my first single. And that sort of kicked open the, the doors for me in, in New Zealand with radio and, and, and just kind of getting my name out there. And I really enjoyed the process at the same time. So yeah, we, we, I just wrote a lot before then. And, um, basically, uh, the, the patch of work that I did after my, my first single and stuff, um, Jaden felt like it wasn't, it was good enough to release, but it wasn't good enough to to put on an album, which looking back was the right decision. And so I just had to keep writing, keep writing, keep writing until the quality was there. And then that's when I, I handed over to the label and they did a great strategy for that first album and it, and it really worked. So yeah, it's um out of my pay grade, but that was just a very long way of saying it. Yeah, no, good info. But when that album came out, was your... 
was your following quite sizable at that just from what, what you'd been drip feeding like was there a lot of hype about the album or was it only until after it came out that you really started to get big yeah i think um it, i didn't have a big following at all really um i think the it was very grassroots um from like my first releases and my label did a great job of of building it to a certain point but i think the the real tipping point in terms of like hype or people getting behind it was uh the ed sharon shows and when i got in front of that many people and people could see that i guess i belonged up there uh i think people just sort of took me for for real and after that was well i i literally went straight from the last show of the ed shows uh, I went literally right to the studio in Auckland to start recording. So it was literally the moment after um, that big high, I was already stuck into capitalizing on it. Yeah, we've we've missed a the link there because <laughs> we've talked about the Ed Sheeran blueprint and then you're opening for him. Yes. How, yeah, yeah. how does that connection work out? How, how did that happen? Yeah, so, I mean, there was a few, like, uh, I always had circled that as something that I wanted to do. And, again, with that crazy drive um, that I had, I still have it, to be honest. But um, it was something that I really wanted to do at, at all costs. And so I ended up signing a, a publishing deal with, uh, with this uh, publishing company that is owned by the promoter of the Ed Sheeran shows. And so... Basically, I did that to put myself in a conversation um, about these shows and just hope that Ed would like my music because there's a big short list of, and it's Ed Sheeran, you know, everyone wants to open for him. So he's got this big list of, of everyone. Dave Dobbin. And yeah, yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe not Dave, uh, Sir Dave. Uh, but yeah, um, there's this big list. And so basically to get on it, I kind of gave up my publishing rights, which, um, you know, should I have done it? Should I have not have? Who knows? But um, at the time, it was this was the opportunity. So I basically got myself onto that shortlist, and it was up to Ed whether uh, whether you made it or not because he's got to like your music essentially. So got on the shortlist. Ed liked the music, um, and it was a very very quick thing. It was probably again about a month before the shows that um, I found out that I I'd got them, and yeah, it was. Uh, it was it was a pretty crazy experience to you know being that kid that uh you know that depressed kid at his show being like you know what do i want to do in life and then to opening up for ed in front of 120,000 people was it's pretty fucking crazy yeah what are the nerves like that that What's first time opening for ed sheeran the fir first song uh, it has, i'm a very sentimental person so i actually played uh, under the bridge as my first song um, because it was like my busking song and it's a great song and I loved it or whatever. <laughs> and I fucked up a couple chords <laughs> in, in the opening. I don't think anyone would have noticed, no, but I was just like, know. fucking hell. <laughs> like 40,000 people out there in, in Dunners, which is such a special place to me. And um, yeah, I, I got my shit together after that first verse or whatever. There was nothing, like, it's just like, thrown in the the deepest of deep ends it was fucking hectic do you go into like a trance when you're performing like that like do you just go into like like athletes describe as going into the zone is it the same when you're performing it's exactly the same bro yeah that um i don't really remember anything on stage like i can i'll get off stage and i'll, I'll have a feeling and i'll be like that was mean or like if i stuff something up i'll be like fuck like that was shit or whatever but it, i can't remember like Moments. Or, Moments. Yeah. yeah, it's all just, it's all just such a adrenaline blur. It's, it, but it's my favorite thing to do in the world. I know that when I am doing it, yeah, you're just so in the zone. Uh, I think in the zone is is the best way to describe it. It's that, it's that, yeah, it's that that u way. I think they call it in in Chinese of just like being in that flow state, and and not really, because if you think about it too much, you know, you're performing in front of people. It's like I was saying to you before you. Just need to keep that energy like clean and flawless as you can because if you're up there like questioning shit or like buzzing out oh my god there's so many people there again you're just kind of shooting yourself in the foot are you a single man at this point in the journey i have Hoping yeah for ed sheeran what is yeah. the attention oh like? no i wasn't back then no. i may have acted like i was though <laughs> <laughs> okay substitute that for a time when you are performing to a huge crowd and you are a single man mm -hmm. what 
what's that like after the show? What's the attention <laughs> like on the the main man? Yeah, it's it's a it's a very novel. It was a very novel feeling for me at the time. After you know my history at school and whatever, it was it was pretty crazy. I look back and I almost have a little bit of empathy for myself because it was. I mean, no one's ever prepared for that. Like, no normal bloke has ever prepared for that. And it, it was, it was pretty full on and very a lot of temptation, um, which I, I mean, looking back, I didn't like deal very well with. You know, it was a very uh, intense uh, baptism by fire. <laughs> if you're right, what what do you mean by not? Are we talking like like lines of women? sort of trying to come and meet you after the show and you're entertaining it all and like what what was the problem with it yeah i mean the problem was i had a girlfriend um but i think the modern day version of that or like even at the time was just like your messages like it's it wasn't so much of like a physical people lining up but there's there's just a, a million different options <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and yeah it was just it was like I said, it was very novel for me at the time and very bizarre. Uh, but, you know, when you're a dude that hasn't ever really got with any girls because you were always, you know, struggling or whatever, it was, yeah, it was it was very intense and a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, it's a crazy situation that no one else could really relate to. You can't be a, a kind of, I don't know, I wouldn't call you a dorky guy, but a guy mm. that didn't get attention and then you've got the whole attention on you and mm. women and i've heard you sort of say in other interviews that some of them treated you like a trophy like it was their oh yeah oh if yeah they, if they got to sleep with the lead singer then that was that was a great night for them yeah and i guess, i guess to be honest it's something that i've struggled with since then you know when when you realize that you know this isn't like a, a sustainable model of living life for like contentment or happiness like just you know getting the pick of the bunch or whatever it's you know, so many kids, especially blokes, grow up thinking like, there's nothing better. There could be nothing better than having an endless line of girls. It, it got to a stage for me where like, it, it didn't, none of it felt genuine from the other side. Like it was, it was, I mean, I've even been in relationships with girls that I look back and feel like, oh, I've just been a fucking trophy here. You for clout. Yeah, and, and when it's the girls that, aren't in relationships if i could fall for that for a girl i'm in a relationship with i can almost guarantee that it's just i've just been a trophy the whole time and so yeah like i said it's fun for a bit but then you kind of reach a crossroads where you're like well i'm still a human i'm still the still the guy that there was a human here before all of this happened and that human is just like everyone else who wants real love and real compassion and real intimacy not just the star uh, sensationalized sort of culture vulture i fucked this dude because he's famous sort of thing and i mean it's like a very uh <laughs> it's a very i i know there'll probably be a few people hearing that and be like what the fuck are you complaining for bro <laughs> yeah but it, yeah it just gets to a stage where you just want to be normal i guess I, i've asked this of um i think comedians as well and it's like it's kind of a luxury that our athletes have sometimes is that they they can dip into like a sports psych or someone who's attached to a team, right? That they can they can process and go mm -hmm. through some of these. Whereas entertainers, you're almost left to your own devices. I, I, like I do wonder, like what is there any support? Is there any kind of formal kind of a safety net that you can kind of call on? Yeah, not really. And I mean, to be honest, like I see a therapist now, but I only started doing that when I just before I turned 27. Like I I didn't have that that luxury of, of, of being able to access that or even afford it really when, when I was coming up and, and you know, I, th I feel like in this industry, or well, at least for myself, there was a lot of like uh, self therapy and like you get through it by learning from your experiences, but there, there isn't really much helping hands or like a, a blueprint or a how to, to deal with all of these things because it doesn't really, happen to barely anyone so there's there's no manual on on how to deal with it and i i definitely struggled a bit but i've yeah i mean having a therapist now has been been great for me it's 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 awesome and i'd recommend it to anyone that that can afford it um but yeah there's there's definitely no no manual and i i slipped up many a time and i guess i just learned from experience 
Yeah, you're obviously a bigger deal now than you were when you were getting all that attention. And we've sort of spoken at the start about how you are a man now and perhaps then you were a boy. Mm. Uh, so how do you how do you deal with it now? Do you have processes in place? Or what's after show look like for Mitch James these days? <laughs> it's a lot different to that, uh, to, the, to those days. Um, yeah, it's, I, I think, um, well, to answer the question about what a sh- after a show looks like, um, it's, it's usually just, I mean, unless it's like a very big milestone, um, I just kind of approach it as, as work. Cause I'll, chances are I have another show coming up very soon, whether it's the next day or whatever. So I just, I just go to bed, yeah. <laughs> just go to bed, cup of tea, that is growing little, up. little yeah. bit of honey in there. Um, are you wired though after a performance? Yeah. It takes about an hour to, hour to come down from all the adrenaline and stuff. Um, but then I think the beauty of it is once it goes, you're just like, you're so conked out that you, you're just ready to rest. But yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's a lot different than it used to be. I, I used to piss up so hard after every gig, every gig. And it's, um, you wonder why like Liam Gallagher and shit have no voice now. Like that's why. Yeah. Like there's that there's, adrenaline dump though, right? Like you're building up to it all week or for days and then it's get it out of your system yeah yeah and especially in new zealand where like if you're doing a new zealand tour um you know there's maybe four or five shows so you can sort of target dates on the calendar and and give them a, a right old ram but yeah it, it, it just depends but i think now as i as i get older and everything i i realize how how blessed i am to be in this position and um and also on the on the other side of that like it's a real big responsibility um you got to show up and give these people your all and make sure that they leave feeling inspired. And so you can't do that if you're not really being your best self. So, you know, like I used to be a little skinny fat bastard, never did any exercise, never did any of this, drink three or four times a week, read my own press thinking I'm the man or whatever. But now it's it's a lot to do with, with discipline and sort of understanding the... Uh, the honor that it is to be in this position because this is what I always wanted. Like, am I just going to be a sad old uh, addict bastard who's, who's blowing it all in a, in a sense, or am I going to make the most of it and be present as possible? And, you know, really can, and in a sense that I can look back and be like, wow, I'm actually really proud of, of how present I was and, and understood the, the assignment essentially. We talk to a lot of really successful people, high achievers, and they all seem to have that same intensity and drive, which mm. you have described in your time in, in the UK on the streets, you know, working through it, but also in your workout regime. Is, is it still three times a day? How long has that been going on? Like you've transformed yourself into this yeah. sort of jacked god. Yeah. Of- oh, stop it, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I should have wore, wore a tighter shirt. Um, yeah, it, uh, it's it's been hard on tour, ad- admittedly. Like... Uh, it hasn't been three times a day like uh, like my usual uh, or when I'm in Auckland routine. Um, it's probably more like a couple runs a week and uh, a couple lifting a week. But if, since I've got back into Auckland, I was, I was saying to Danny, <laughs> I got off the flight uh, back from Singapore, hadn't slept. I went straight to the gym and then went for a 10K run afterwards. <laughs> it's I don't know. I, I don't know why, to be honest, but um, I think it just comes down to just it's so cliche, but trying to be the best version of myself. And I realize that I feel a lot better when I'm, I'm being active and, you know, it, it does help in this industry to not be in shit shape, you know? So I really like, I'm just always trying to excel at whatever I do. And I understand that this is not only a part of my job, but it's actually a part of what makes me the best at my job. And that's showing up to, work whenever it is in in the best frame of mind and best frame of body i can be in you seem to draw inspiration from fight sports athletes as well right yes like, bro, uh, big time conor big time. conor mcgregor was one of yours and you yeah yeah yeah. we'll get to the tattoos <laughs> soon and i saw you did a podcast with tai tui vasa mm-hmm. how was that experience was that before he is who he is now yeah well i was yeah it was with him and tyson pedro and uh, i've got a lot of time for both of those boys in fact, I I'd literally just come, <laughs> yeah. I just come off a twenty seven hour flight from London. Um, me and my mate Eli, who's the the drummer for Six Sixty, we we had a a very big night, um, and we didn't sleep the whole way back. Um, 
then as soon as I got to Australia, um, the first thing I had was, was the half cast podcast with, with Ty and Tyson. And I w- I w- I'm not going to lie, I was a bit like, uh, I don't know how this is going to go. Um, and as soon as I got there and, and chatted to those boys, man, they're just, they're fucking awesome. They're, they're such lads. And they're just, again, they're just really good at what they do. Um, but the, the human side of them start, shines through like right away. And yeah, I love those boys. They're, they're fucking awesome. And they, uh, they really represent Australia and, and, and New Zealand um, so, so well. You know, we, we've got the champ here as well, uh, Izzy Adesanya, and he's about to fight. And I, I, I just all, I think it's the mindset which I really draw from those guys. Like I, Connor was the first person to really inspire me about uh, if you have a dream, don't let fucking anything get in the way of it and i see these guys as extensions of that um that have just come from you know western sydney or or nigeria or or wherever they may be i think the one thing they all have in common is that if you're going to tell me i should give up i'm going to go twice as fucking hard and i i love that about fighters because it's so you're so naked there in in the cage and it's like you're on stage you're especially when you're not playing with anyone like I have been the last month, it's, if you fuck something up, it's all on you, bro. Like, it's so, yeah, I, I've always looked at those guys as people that when you need to perform in the moment, they're always on, and I just respect that so much. You made a comment earlier that I'm keen to loop back to, and I can understand if you don't want to talk about it, but it might help paint a picture of what the last four years have looked like. You said you signed your publishing rights away, mm-hmm. and you're not sure if you should have done that. And I think that was like it was that like a contract, a multi-record uh, mm-hmm. deal. And and can you sort of link that into yeah, basically the time between the last album and this one? Yeah, I mean the the publishing deal in in particular, um, as as sort of. Uh, I guess irrelevant to the last four years, but it was it was a big thing in, in getting the Ed shows and the the team there are, are great. I, I can't say anything bad about them as people. Um, but yeah, I, the last the last four years, um, it was very frustrating for me because the the album uh, was doing so so well, um, and you know I'd got hundreds of millions of streams and plaques from countries I'd never been to and, and things like that. Um, so I was riding a high and then I released a song called Sunday Morning, which I felt was super strong and it, and it was doing really, really well. And this is like the end of, uh, 2019. Yeah, we were trying to figure, we were, we were trying to piece this together. So I'm glad yeah. that you're going, you're glad that you're going into this. Yeah, no, I got you, right. <laughs> um, yeah, so it was, it was the end of 2019 and, and things were, I was, I had the feeling in my stomach where I was like, oh fuck, like shit's about to happen for real now like i can feel it all the metrics are lining up great and then um and then COVID happened and um you know there was another big drama that happened behind the scenes which is a bit of a bit of a long long too long a yarn for this this podcast but basically must be be very long if it's too long for this (laughs) (laughs) um yeah that one that one's that one's ours um but yeah so basically i i moved to australia um on the last flight before their borders closed and uh, I was ready to, to go to work for a year and um, and basically nothing happened for, for two years and I thought I had this album that I was very proud of and um, it wasn't allowed to be released for, uh, for whatever reason. Um, and so I, I was sitting there just kind of watching and this is just on the career side, I'll get to the, the personal side, but I was I was just sitting there watching everything that I worked for just day by day, little grains of sand are just falling out of my hand. And then it got to a stage where it had been uh, two and a bit years since I'd even released a song. Um, and so, you know, we tried a bunch of different things, kind of forced a couple songs that didn't work. And when you're forcing songs that don't work, the sand starts falling a little quicker. Um, and I basically found myself in a position where I felt like I was starting again um, because just nothing had worked and there was a lot of behind the scenes things that were, were super hard and, and confusing. And, and so, you know, I, I kept getting told that whatever iteration I'd bring of this album, that it didn't sound good enough or it didn't sound like this, it didn't sound like that. 
so it wasn't going to get released um so that made me not only doubt myself but kind of doubt whether i had it still um and then you know you you copy in the the other side of things the personal side of things you know my my family uh, had basically my, my parents were were both very very sick um same with uh with a sibling of mine who was very sick um i even i even had some some issues in there as well um horrible breakups and then the the personal side of covid being stuck in australia for nine months not knowing anyone not being able to see anyone um it was, it was very very confronting and then i, I lost a friend to a, a good friend to suicide which was you know obviously very tough and it was it was just a it just felt like it was a never-ending uh fountain of of shit and yeah it, it just uh it got to a stage where you know the the songs that i was releasing weren't working and it, it just made me doubt myself professionally and then all of that pressure from from the the, the home life and and things like that it was uh yeah it, it was just very tough and so i i figured that the music that i was writing at the time you know i was going out with a girl who's you know the without being disrespectful of like very socialite uh circles and and so I found that the music that I was making was less uh, honest and probably more trying to be cool and, and fit that, in. That's in your those. superpower, right? Is your authenticity. Yes. And your ability to, exactly. to draw from real life experience. Exactly. And so I wasn't doing that and, and things just weren't working. And here I was just thinking about, oh, but we were just like, we were right there before this fucking COVID thing came along. It was, it was right there. It was working. Like, what am I, what am I doing wrong? And basically it's exactly what you said Seamus I, I I came to a realization that what I was doing wasn't me and the people that have got behind me the reason they have done that is because they saw themselves in me and my stories and and you, you can't do that trying to be Mr. Cool you've got to you've got to do that by being Mr. Honest and so yeah it's just all of that and you know there's things that I've left out just to not involve people um, but yeah, it's just all of that sort of clouded together and, and made it a very, uh, challenging time for, you know, I, and, and obviously I, I made zero dollars and zero cents in that time cause I couldn't play any shows. So it was, um, yeah, it was a very, very tough time, but I guess you have a choice when, when you're in a situation like that, are you going to let it defeat you or are you going to use it as a blessing and an inspiration to go and write some music that can change people's lives? And so I just uh, really tried to do that. That's just what I was going to say. And firstly, thank you so much for being so vulnerable and open My and, pleasure, and sharing all of this. Like, it, there's some really sort of deep stuff there. But, and the last few years sound like hell. They sound horrible. Mm. Um, but if there is a ray of light, if there is a silver lining, it's that it gives you great material to write from, right? Soulful, meaningful stuff. Me and Shay were listening to your stuff on the way out. Like, we look really great music because Thank it's you, so authentic Thank um you. but is that the sil that, that's silver lining right you've got so much and and especially the stuff we st spoke about the spa the start sorry i can't even talk now but um your journey is so so deep in, in so many different directions there's so many pockets to reach from for your music right Ex exactly man and like i said that was the the choice i had am i am i gonna just you know try and continue to be someone that i'm not or am I going to look in the mirror and realize what got me here in the first place? And yeah, there was, there was so much to, when I repositioned the, uh, the mind frame, there was so much to write about. There was almost too much to write about. And so it was a hundred songs worth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But I mean, when I, when I look back at it, when I really flipped the switch, I'd, I'd say only probably 15 to 20 of them were of the right mind frame. And that all started earlier this year. And so, yeah, I, I just, I felt like I had to do it and I had to be super honest. Like there's a song on, on this album about, basically about tall poppy syndrome in, in New Zealand and my like personal experience with it. And I would have never felt comfortable enough to re release a song like that or a song that says, you know, my parents are sick or a song that says, you know, basically, basically there's a song on there called Cloud, which is talking about how I used to, it's it's addressed in a very light-hearted way but it's basically saying like i used to not want to be alive um 
but it's all like happy pop music saying i wish i could be a cloud but what i'm trying to say is sometimes you, i didn't want to be a person so it's it's very uh like i said multiple times i feel like it's my duty to to do this because if if someone else isn't going to do it and i'm sitting at home feeling all these things uh, why not me <laughs> yeah there's a line in motions where you reference your dad mm -hmm. and that hits for me because my dad's no longer with me either mm -hmm. and you talk about songs that, that that you might not listen to again are mm. you able with with some of the themes that you write about once you've written about them and sung about them to divorce the feeling from the words yeah i, I think so bro and i think it's it's not intentional um for me because uh, i look at callum when i'm on stay uh, uh on tour with callum and uh, bless him uh, he he'll he'll cry like a lot because he's he's like feeling these emotions about these super super vulnerable songs but i feel like once the song is out to the public it's it's no longer mine and that it's ours almost and so i i tend to start to get the joy from seeing other people connect with it um but up until that moment i can't really divorce from it it's it's a song about me and my dad or it's a song about my relationship with this person or that person but and you know when i'm listening alone in the car like going for a drive like there will be tears and there will be that but as soon as it's it's out i'm just like man it's all yours now give it give me give me what you feel about it essentially with the backstory that we've just covered like i'm so excited for these next few days in the week like to get this out there like man yeah, right. it's it's been so long coming do you have moments of reflection and perhaps now before this next part of chapter of your life is about to start like mm. 200 million plus streams on spotify mm. do you ever sit and think Gee. numbers guy numbers Gee. guy <laughs> yeah do you ever think fuck <laughs> me like yeah, i've bro. achieved i've kind of done something yeah i, I think uh, there's always a battle in my head about um uh between like uh gratitude and humility and like i i again x numbers guy here um i I would always used to picture like what however many million people would look like out in front of me and you know if you had 250 million people out in front of you it it would be so fucking hard to fathom like it would be like almost like there's no fucking way that my music has reached this many people um and yeah so i used to like picture it as that but then i would frame it in like a grateful way and be like wow you know th th this is crazy you remember when you were fucking busking on the street like it's you've come so far and and be grateful for it um and then there's the other side of of the battle which is not letting you lose yourself and how crazy the the achievement is so i mean new zealanders are pretty good at uh at uh bringing you back down um but i also think it's a balance like you don't want to get too locked down and you don't want to be at the pub with your mates like i was yesterday and just trying to shut the fuck up and blend in and 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 chill but you also don't want to be the guy who's like yeah fucking uh, the however many now just check the numbers yeah. Yeah, oh, right. another one of mine playing yeah ex boring ex exactly <laughs> it's i think it's just a balance thing eh? and um i feel like i'm in a good place with it with it now um but it took me it took me years to to find that balance for sure I'm I'm curious, and I don't want to pry too much, but you you referenced earlier you didn't have a great relationship with your parents and with mm -hmm. your family. It sounds to me like that's been mended, but where where is that? If you're comfortable to talk about now? Yeah, no, no, we're uh, we're very strong now. Um, I think uh, well, my mum got sick uh, when I was ooh, I must have been like 22 or 23, which is just as I started to uh, was when I was talking to Sony about my record deal. Um, and so up from 15 to 21 or 22, we, we didn't really talk that much at all. Um, and it was, it was because they disagreed with some of the things that I was doing and they had their way of looking at life and I had my way of looking at life. Um, and you know, my sisters didn't like hanging out with me. I must've been fucking blazed. Oh my God. <laughs> um, but yeah, we just didn't get along and it got pretty ugly on, on, on some, some pretty hectic levels but i think once my when my mum got sick it, I, um everyone just sort of realized like 
fuck we're being dumb you know like we're we're, we're family we're whanau like we're blood let's just leave our shit at the door and fucking work this out and so it took it took probably a year after that to get to like a no awkwardness no uh residue of anything um but yeah it, it, it took a while but we we got there and you know now now my family is you know we don't need to talk every day but um we're we're very strong and we love each other a lot and you know my, one of my sisters has now got a little bub so we're all uh we're all in love with him and it's all happy days in the james family but i think the the one moment that really kind of sunk in for my parents was i don't think they understood what a record deal was when i was like i got a fucking record deal like things are going to change uh, like I'm not going to be a heroin addict in, in prison. Like <laughs> I'm going to be good. Um, and they didn't get it cause nothing happened for like five, six months. But when, when they heard move on on the radio for the first time, I think they were like, Oh shit. I, I think we, we may have got it a little bit wrong here. And we just, we just met at the table like, uh, like adults and, um, just mended it. You know, I th feel like nothing in life is perfect. And, but, things like family and things like friends, they're so crucial to what it is to live a meaningful life that you have to fight for those things. And sometimes it's not all easy. Man, it's been such a captivating chat and it's so obvious why you're the successful songwriter you are. You know, the the, the depth you can go Thank to you, and the way you can articulate it is cool. Shay is our bits and pieces guy and our wrap up guy. I'm not sure what he's got left on the list. Um, bits and pieces. Uh, this is a real left field tangent. <laughs> Streaking? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we're going from the deep to the uh Is deep. that is that you? Is that That's me, bro. That's me. Yeah, nice. <laughs> yeah, so I'll tell I'll tell you how my streaking journey. <laughs> that's so yeah. that's, that's so incredible to think of how shy you might have been in terms of playing music, but you'll get your kid off. No, Billy, we're, Billy we're, Maverick's help, brother. Uh, <laughs> that, um bro, so the first one, the first streak, which is Pandora's box essentially being open. I was down at Auckland University uh, Rugby Club and there was some cricket going on. Um, it was kind of, uh, I think from memory, it was kind of when like rugby and cricket cross over a little bit. Um, so like the, the club rooms were open and I remember a bunch of um, uh, my mates and their older brothers, they were, they were like, fuck, oh, like, I've got a jug for anyone who can streak this cricket game. And then someone else is like, oh, I've got a jug too, blah, blah, blah. There's like, Seven blokes are like, I've got a jug for whoever does it. And no one raised their hand. And I was like, fuck it. I'm just, fuck it, who cares? It's just a cricket game. Um, and then, so, you know, I got the kid off, uh, ran around, uh, got a hero's welcome back at the, uh, at, at the, at the footy club. Um, jugs galore. It was good time. Was there a female streak as well, was there? No, no, I wish, <laughs> I wish. Um, but so, so this was maybe about a year or two before the streaking got a bit out of hand. Um, I don't think streaking can ever get out of hand. <sighs> can get in the hand. Oh, <laughs> hey, oh, oh, now we're playing. Now we're playing. And so w me and my mates had this thing called chances. And so it's like, I, and some people call it odds, where you're like, oh, mate, chances of you going to streak this cricket game. And I'll be like, oh, seven. And then so... Uh, you got to do a countdown, three, two, one, and then you say a number between one and seven. Nice. If you match up, I have to do it. If they add up to the number, the total number, seven, say we, you oh, say two. three. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We both have to do it. Um, so, oh, oh, good. Yeah. It's <laughs> good no, it's a high you still play, do you still yeah. play this now? <laughs> no, no, because it got way too out of hand. Like, like my mates speaking, have got right? tattoos on their asses. Yeah, and wow. I technically owe my friends a name change for a year to change my name to LeBron James. Because wow. uh, legally, because of chances, <laughs> um, still going to happen one day. I promise the boys. Um, but yeah, so uh, I did a few chances streaks on on some some lame ass, you know, Sunday cricket stuff. And then um, <laughs> me and my mates were pissing up one one day, and there was a big. Uh, my old school were playing their rivals in the semi-finals for the the one a first 15. i've seen this yeah and it made the new it made both news as it was crazy and we were drinking billy mavs during the during the morning and we're just young young idiots and um i uh i <laughs> i i was like you know what like, i'm i'm gonna streak this game like fuck it it's on the rugby channel we'll have a laugh um and so uh so basically we get there like um 
this was my fatal error was running from uh the home side yeah. into the uh away uh fans and so there's this real funny video i like I'm, i take my kid off i streak across the side i do a little wax on a couple of the uh <laughs> couple of the wingers and shit who are lining me up and i slide underneath the um underneath the the, the barrier to the uh <laughs> to the away team side and holy shit did i get the fuck beaten out on yeah. yeah there's this video of of like a bird's eye view almost of it and there's people just throwing hammer fist dropping knees into me and shit and so I make my way beaten and bruised up this. Um, what are you protecting at that point when you're streaking? Are you <laughs> just trying to trying just to cover? Just anything? trying to run. Yeah, just right. trying to just trying to move from A to B. There's a car waiting for me up on the other side of this field, and um, <laughs> I was way out of shape at this time. And there's this video of me like running up this hill, and by the time I'm three quarters up the hill, I can't run anymore because I'm so <laughs> gassed and, and beaten up. And I'm just running there with a you know my fucking willies out and everything, and I'm shameless little pasty boy just trying to run to this car and then uh you know it was all a big laugh we went back to the flat and we we had more beers and we actually had a great karaoke night that night and didn't think much of it and then um <laughs> the next day it's on one news it's on three news um and yeah the uh saint kent streaker uh if you type in saint kent streaker on google you'll be able to oh there's our clip eh? you'll be able yeah, to we'll, run, it, yeah. we'll run that footage yeah. from <laughs> holding a, i'm holding a billy mav wearing a headgear um yeah, it was it was good times. Proper streaking too, like no no hand covering. Oh, no gone. hand covering. Yeah. No, that that defeats the purpose. I I you know I might not be too gifted downstairs, but you know you just you just got to run with it. That bravery counts for something. Yeah, exactly. And and yeah, so it t turned to a thing, and then I ended up uh, doing a few more streaks in Dunedin and streaking some lectures and yeah, nice and just. Is no, I mean, the only other rush that's comparable to being on stage is streaking. streaking yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, I I've retired. I've, I was going to say, I've, I've yeah, up, the profile's a bit big I've now. Hung to up, be, I've to hung, be streaking. hung up the sack. <laughs> and, um, I, was to, I was trying to think, what do I? How do I phrase what you've hung up? Oh, yeah, hung up the sack. I've hung up the sack, and we're uh, we're professionals now. A uh, bit of gold there Amazing. from the insider. Uh, any anything else, Shay? I just wondered if there's ever a tuatara. Uh, baseball contract on the horizon should you ever decide to leave music if you were super talented right played for yeah. new zealand captain new zealand yeah yeah i captain new zealand at uh, a world series it was the first time we've ever ever been to a world series in uh in maine bangor maine uh in 2012 i think it was and i still go to the batting cage every now and then maybe like once a month or something and go and hit and uh, a couple of the boys that are in the tuatara they uh they run the the joint and they they they're trying to get me to come back and play every time. They said that I'd be one of the best hitters in the in the Auckland League if I if I came back. So uh, I don't really have the time or uh, to do it, and uh, I enjoy just hitting at the batting cage rather than fucking around for for three and a half hours. But um, it was it was a big part of my life, baseball, and I will always love it. And yeah, I mean, if the Tuatara want to sign me to like a one day contract or whatever, you know, I'd fucking love to do it. To, to fill out a, a a dream of playing professional baseball, but I would be able to I would be able to hang with them if I let's say I put like a year of of full training into it. I'd I'd be able to I'm pretty confident I'd be able to get to to that level at least. Maybe not where some of the more elite New Zealand guys are in like the minor leagues in, in the states, but um, I'd definitely be able to get a hit or two at uh, at the uh, Australian Baseball League level for sure. As long as you don't make those uh, those viral clips of someone being called out to throw the opening pitch and just have an absolute shocker in terms of like not being able to throw it to the catcher i'd be one of those dudes who takes it way too uh, handies as well i'd be like you need your fucking gear because i'm going <laughs> who had a shock was it obama or someone like that oh, they all, yeah. i think it was biden maybe Fuck yeah, it. His yeah. Was brutal. There, there's um oh shack shack had a shocker yeah. I feel like I 50 mean, Cent had a real yeah, bad yes, one. Yes, he did. He a, did. He knowledge up. shake. Yeah. He was a Good he was niche all knowledge. Yeah, you know. uh, right, okay. I'm going to wrap us up. I just want to say, by the time people are listening to this, the album will be out. Mm -hmm. So uh, for people that have made it this far, you're really, I feel like you're really going to appreciate it because you know the journey, you know the struggle, sure. you know the highs, you know the lows. Um, so good luck with everything. Like I'm really excited to follow your progress. And, Thank you, brother. Uh, I, I hope... Yeah, the world of success for you. But I'm not the outro guy. That's Shay. So I'm going to throw to him to, to close us off. Uh, at only 27, I feel like you've lived sort of three lives. But what I appreciated the most out of tonight is that good, bad, and indifferent, you've owned everything that you've done. 
and you seem to have this unshakable positivity about you now, which when you started said um, you kind of almost you've tricked yourself into into believing it, but it, yeah. but it. it it doesn't come across that way. It's a it's a genuine positivity, and I think there's a lot of people that can learn a lot of things from from your story. Thank you. Um, and like Steve, I'm really looking forward to seeing how the album drops, but also not just this, but the whole career, um, and where you end up. Because at such a tender age, you've got a lot more learning and living to to give to people. So long may it continue. Appreciate it, Shay. Thank you, brother. No worries. Cheers, man. Cheers, fellas. Appreciate it.